The decade was the 80s. The Berlin Wall had crumbled. New technologies were emerging through the use of computers. Yeah, you remember those bad boys? And music television, or MTV, which was by far the best thing that ever came out of television as a young kid right next to Toonami. It pretty much paved the way for pop culture and like the young generation, which was me, and now we're slowly getting old, but we don't accept it, but that's besides the point. Even more so, okay, in the automotive industry, technologies like fuel injection, turbocharging cars, and even airbags started to become standard features in vehicles that we now look back as some of the industry's greats. But back during that time, Honda was trying to do something special. And what they ended up doing was changing how the automotive industry built their motors. I'm Alex, alex.martini with two underscores at the end on Instagram. And today we're talking about just why VTech was such an influential technology in the automotive industry and probably why you don't seem to care about it anymore. Welcome, and don't forget to subscribe so we can keep making videos like this. I know it's cheesy, the wood is getting rotted. This is how I actually break the sound. There's like crates and I have a blanket over the camera. Please don't judge me. But if you could drop a comment, that would mean a lot. I'm responding to every single comment out on YouTube. And if you're looking to support our interested in bespoke handmade automotive apparel, you can add your email to the link below and you get first dibs on what we make next. And the next drop is old school RuneScape themed. I'm very excited. With that, let's get into it, okay? The concept of variable valve timing goes before Honda, VTech, the memes, and even passenger cars. It was actually in motorcycles and pretty much everything else besides cars. As simple as it sounds, an internal combustion engine is fairly simple. You have intake, you have some gas, you have some pressure, combustion, you have some gases that you got to deal with at the end of it, and then all that stuff powers some things that make your wheels go Prr! The powers and the movement and the cylinders and all that sort of stuff, it's, too, it's that's, next, that's next class, okay? We don't need to talk about that. However, the timing though, the duration the valves being open, the lifting of the valves, all play an incredibly important role on the engine's performance because that's essentially what handles the combustion and pushes everything else through. Keeping the valve timing, valve length, and intake exhaust pressures constant in a motor is similar to diving into a pool and going as far down as you can without popping your ears. It hurts like a mother okay? And an engine, that becomes equipped with variable valve timing essentially allows compromises in the needed performance of the internal systems to maximize mileage, power, and engine longevity. Take it back to the analogy of being in a pool, it essentially makes it so that you can do more at different, you know, depths. It doesn't feel as bad. You pop your ears, you can go down about 10 more feet. It's pretty fun. Now remember, engines use valves which are managed by camshafts. When the cams open or lift, the valves sit in a position for a period of time during each intake and exhaust cycle. That timing, in addition to where the crankshaft is located as the engine performs, is important. And is where Honda and quite a few others saw incredible opportunity to improve their engine's performance, their mileage, and essentially have a little bit of room to grow to try and get old dad to buy their car. But this wasn't in the 1980s, or the 1990s, or the 2000s. This problem started all the way back in the 1920s. Companies like Cadillac were filing patents to adjust inlet valve gears for their engines. In 1919, Vauxhall's chief designer developed a revised 4.4 liter engine that featured a variable camshaft system to improve performance for their engines. In 1958, Porsche decided to jump into it and applied for an additional patent that used an oscillating cam to try and increase performance, even though they did absolutely nothing with it. And even Fiat would officially be the first to launch a functional vehicle with variable valve timing systems and variable lift. But if you don't think we're done, you'd be wrong. Alfa Romeo would be the first manufacturer to use it in production cars in the 1980 Romeo Spider 2000. And then even after that, after all of that, after everyone else was kind of trying to figure this stuff out, in 1989, Honda would release their VTEC system. Do you have a VTEC? VTEC Love. So why is it important? Why is it coined as like the first big one? Why does nobody care about Alfa Romeo? Well, VTEC was one of the first systems and actually the only system that used a lockable rocker arm and a dual profile camshaft. What this did was it allowed Hondas to essentially have two almost completely different camshaft profiles 
that could be picked depending on the engine speed and was hydraulically selected depending on the motor's performance. You could get great fuel efficiency at low RPMs because it was using the low, small lobes of the camshaft and the higher power needed at the high RPMs using that middle or secondary camshaft profile. It was pretty freaking awesome and it was pretty ingenious. This allowed Honda Motors to widen their power range, minimize vehicle costs, and retain a reliable gas mileage that was getting incredibly more important in the consumer market, specifically here in the United States, because going into the 80s, that was a big deal. So while the technology behind VTEC came from the motorcycle side originally, it didn't take long for Honda engineers to implement it into their passenger cars. As VTEC began to get developed, the target goal was essentially to make it so that a Honda motor could get 100 horsepower per liter and could still maintain a quality assurance of being able to stay alive for 15 years and 250,000 kilometers. It had to be met if they wanted to go along with this project, and they did. America would get to experience this new technology, which was pretty freaking cool. Something that bumped power in a way that mirrored that of a turbocharger in the 1992 Honda NSX. It was introduced in the 1992 GSR, the Del Sol, and the Prelude, along with the second generation CRX, and some others, and it pretty much came at the perfect time of the rush of the Japanese tuning scene that was coming to the Americas, but with the price affordability of the mainstream market. And that's super key. It was a new technology that everyone could get their hands on. Honda's VTEC system invigorated the sport compact market and gave serious competition to vehicles like the Probe GT. You can make fun of it. I get it but it was a good car back then. Mazda RX-7 and DSMs for the day, it really gave them a run for their money. And because the system was so unique, so different, normal automotive enthusiasts were blown away by just what it was doing. Like it sounded like an entirely different car when VTEC kicked in, yo. That was the whole joke, but back when it was introduced, it was that. People that would test drive these cars actually stated that they would feel like they damaged the engine because of the kick of the power and the change of the tone. There's stories everywhere of people thinking that they broke this brand new car. But it was an incredibly simple but reliable system that was just heavily mechanical by nature, and it allowed Honda enthusiasts to feel like they had two separate types of engines. And in addition to that, because VTEC has valve lift and variable valve timing, that in its simplest sense, was controlled by a pin, you got everything you needed out of an affordable, sport compact sports car that wasn't matched until pretty much every other automotive manufacturer came out with their own version. I don't know who you are, but I'm not answering it. Valtronic, VVTL, intake valve lift control, Vario Cam, iActive valve lift systems, MyVec, CPS, and more are just a few of the other variable valve timing systems that are out there and kind of are in their own place. Everybody's got their own name on, okay? Because of Honda's introduction, though, of VTEC in their platforms, there's a fairly large community that believes that the reason they're still Honda enthusiasts to this day is because of VTEC being the deciding factor of their first or second car purchase almost three decades ago. Like, that's insane. And when I was just coming into the scene, VTEC was still being talked about consistently enough to make me think maybe I want a Prelude versus getting something like a 3000 GT SL. And that was before like when I knew that my good old friend Dale was like doing turbocharged and throwing slicks on Civics and pretty much blew the doors off of every car in Eau Claire. But you could whoop some serious ass with a VTEC engine and you could pretty much drag anyone. Nowadays, it's mostly mentioned as a meme, but I would argue that VTEC is probably the reason that most of us were able to get into some relatively fun cars without paying like B5 S4 maintenance prices, which it's not as big a deal now, but it was a big deal back when the car scene was really starting to grow into the tuner segment. But what do you think? Do you remember your first time with a VTEC engine? Did you notice anything or was it just another slow Honda? Let me know below and of course, don't forget to subscribe, add your email to the website below so you can get notified of the next drop and we will see you later. Adios.